Right, so hello everybody. Uh, good afternoon. As you're probably all fully aware, uh, we've got Finn this afternoon talking about the um, totally terrifying situation that's the developments in the Middle East. So I'm, I'm not going to wrap rabbit on. I'll just uh, I'll just let Finn say what he has to say. How long do you want to speak for, Finn? I say about twenty minutes or so, Pam. Yeah, so I'll give you another chapter fifteen. Yeah. But is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, can everybody just keep themselves on mute as well so we don't get any background noises from your houses? Okay. My comrades, uh, every day when we watch the news, I read the papers, the unfolding horrors that are happening in Israel and Palestine at the moment seem to be unprecedented. There's more than 2,000 Palestinians already dead since the uh, events of a week ago. 1,400 Israelis killed. One million Gazans making their way south to avoid being killed in bombings. And then there was a slaughter across the uh, the border fence with uh, Gaza, with people, innocent people in towns and villages, plus a pop concert with three and a half thousand young people were also attacked, this time, of course, by Hamas. And then hostages, more than 100 hostages taken into Gaza. And in addition to that story, which is unfolding to date, we're now expecting a horrific event in the near future. If, as it's not inevitable, but if, as seems to be the case, the Israeli army invades uh, Gaza directly and seizes control of northern Gaza, as they said they would do, mind you, they might reconsider that, considering all the implications of it, it's not automatic. But if they do, you can only imagine the level of killing and slaughter they will happen. When we have discussions of this nature, it's always determined to some extent by crisis across the globe. Uh, you know, we, we talk about the crisis of capitalism, the inability of capitalism to solve the problems and the failure of the labor leadership and the socialist leadership to intervene effectively in events such as this. But in Israel, there are specific features of the situation which need to be understood internally as well. So it can't all be explained in terms of the general crisis of capitalism and the general failure of reformism. There are specific features as well. The international bodies, the United Nations and all the various other bodies that came out of World War II are shown to be completely inadequate and completely important in dealing with situations such as this. The international law, insofar as there are laws about war, are, are being broken all the time. The Geneva Conventions are being broken. There's no question war crimes are being committed. And incidentally, the uh, Hamas fighters are also culpable of war crimes, the killing of civilians, I assume possibly also the killing of hostages. But there's nothing whatever the international organizations that were set up, particularly after World War II, can do about that. Israel is using starvation as a method of war. By blockading Gaza in terms of electricity, fuel, uh, medical goods, food and so on, that's uh, against the rules of international law. Even the very uh, question of Gaza itself is in breach of, uh, or its status is in breach of the United Nations resolution. Gaza was seized by Israel, as was the West Bank taken by Israel and still being held, even though that's in breach of the United Nations uh, resolutions. There have been a number of wars fought around this issue, and they're all directly related to the attitudes of the Israeli government to the occupied territories. I'm thinking of the war, for example, 74, the war of Yom Kippur. Incidentally, the Yom Kippur war, the anniversary of that, was at the time of the uh, attacks by Hamas. Gaza itself is a very small region just on the edge of the Mediterranean. Population of 2.3 million, 140 or thereabouts square miles, which is actually very, very small. But 80% of Palestinians there are in need of humanitarian assistance. There's a tremendous unemployment, poverty, and a total failure of the economy to advance because since the blockade began in 2007, GDP in Gaza has fallen 50%. So the Gazan the people can't climb out of this situation themselves. The border restrictions which are imposed or had been imposed by Israel and still are, but also were imposed by Egypt. 
Uh, something like sixty percent of Gazans live below the poverty line. Uh, the, sorry, the poverty line. So it's no surprise that there's a tremendous amount of alienation and dejection and depression amongst people in Palestine in that small area on the edge of the Mediterranean. But Hamas themselves, who are the um, government of that country, are also a repressive regime. They try to impose um, Sharia restrictions on the people. They have a perspective of turning the state into an Islamic state, not just that, but the entire area of what used to be a brief mandate, Palestine, including Israel. Hamas's aim is to convert all of that region into an Islamic state. And of course, that's not only unrealizable, but it's a totally reactionary uh, demand. And the GDP has fallen, living standards have fallen, and poverty has increased in Gaza. The population statistics in Gaza are interesting. 70% of the population are under 30. So obviously, it's a predominantly youthful uh, population. Many thousands of Gazans go to work in Israel and the West Bank on special permits where they work in agriculture, services, and of course the wages then are 10 times more than they would get in Gaza. It's worth mentioning also that there's been no elections in Gaza since 2006. The conflict which is now happening between Israel and uh, Gaza has the possibility of taking on a regional dimension and other countries being drawn in. Now, Iran would be reluctant uh, to get involved and they're kind of keeping a distance from us. Uh, their main agents in Gaza are Islamic Jihad, although they do fund and do support uh, Hamas also. The group that they're closest to in Lebanon is with Hezbollah. And Hezbollah don't want to be upstaged either by Hamas. So they're joining in the uh, conflict so far as it suits them. But in the, in the West Bank, the conditions that people endure there are terrible. There's a huge amount of people in prison. 2,000 of them haven't even been charged yet. Uh, the Israeli policy in the West Bank is uh, house demolitions, uh, water springs being blocked up, Palestinian farmers chased off their lands by settlers, a road system, which I saw myself when I was in Palestine, where people who have special number plates, special colored number plates, who be Israeli citizens, have access to modern roads that link Jerusalem to all the outlying districts. Palestinian uh, people who have a different color number plate are not allowed to use these roads, and they use roads of a far, far inferior quality. And as I say, we saw them uh, ourselves when we were there. There's confiscation of property all the time. There's shootings. This isn't new, of Palestinians, many of them children. And Palestinians themselves are confined often to enclaves and a lot of refugee uh, camps on the West Bank. And the refugee camps are terrible uh, places, uh, overcrowding the uh, housing complexes piled up on each other, uh, stuff of that nature. We visited uh, the town of Hebron, and in, in Hebron there was... Uh, a net thrown across the top of the street because settlers in the region were throwing their garbage onto the streets in Hebron and the net was collecting the garbage before it hit the people on the streets. We saw that ourselves in her photographs to that effect. That's just an illustration of the contempt which some sections of the Israeli society, particularly the settlers, have towards uh, Palestinians. Even the terminology that's used by the Israeli government, they don't accept the existence of Palestine as a nation. Golda Meir doesn't even accept that Palestinians exist, or didn't. Uh, she was kicked out after the Yom Kippur War. And they use the terminology of Judea and Samaria for the region, which are biblical terms which associate that part of uh, the world with uh, Israel. And then on the Arab, uh, amongst the Arab countries, who used to pretend that they supported Palestine have no interest really in the plight of the Palestinian people. Bahrain, the United Arab Republic, Morocco, Kuwait, other countries are doing trade deals with Israel in order to advance their own economies and don't care at all about the fate of Palestinians. 
the recent uh, deal that UAR is doing with Israel brought them 2.56 billion last year in trade uh, uh, trade advantages for these countries. And that situation further isolates the Palestinian people, particularly in Gaza, because they can see nobody is actually going to support them. One of the uh, results of the attack by Hamas in Israel has been not to strengthen Netanyahu. Netanyahu is probably uh, extremely unpopular at the moment in Israel because of the security uh, breaches that were exposed. And his personal support will have gone down significantly. In fact, I understand that a lot of ministers don't appear in public anymore, even at funerals, because of the abuse they have to listen to from the people of Israel over their security failures and absolutely abysmal collapse of security, uh, the, the security system in Israel. But nonetheless, the attacks by Hamas have caused the reservists, for instance, who were refusing to serve, re refusing to sign up for action because of their opposition to Netanyahu and the judicial uh, changes, have now enlisted 100%. They're all queuing up to defend uh, Israel against further attacks by uh, Hamas. And that's an example of a negative uh, influence that these kind of acts, such as Hamas, carried out are uh, what they can achieve. Now, the situation is not in any way improving because the situation does what Israel wants to achieve is the complete destruction of Hamas. But that's not easy to accomplish. It's easy to make that as an aim, but that's not going to happen easily. If they do invade uh, a, a ground invasion in Gaza, that, that won't be an easy operation either because uh, going from house to house which would, would involve, uh, would involve uh, will lead to several Israeli uh, deaths and uh, lots of destruction. It's different firing from the air, launching rockets and buying up the entire uh, city. It's a different question when they enter the country. There are also implications in this conflict also for Jews across other countries. Uh, even in Britain, uh, there's a lot of uh, attacks now on Jews. It's happening in America, right there at the weekend. Um, it's it's happening in several several places. Uh, in France, there's been arrests of people for attacks on Jews. Now, Hamas itself needs to be examined. There's a tendency among some people on the left to worship what I would say, worship the accomplished fact. The fact that Hamas are now in conflict with Israel makes their choices very simple. You support Hamas. But that attitude has, has often been adopted by sections of the left. It happened in Ireland here with the IRA. Uh, they thought that they'll support the IRA. In fact, in the uh, mid-70s, the two major Trotskyist groups in England at the time, the International Marxist uh, Group, OMG, and the International Socialists, the IS, both of them supported the IRA in their campaign against the British Army in the north of Ireland. That was shown to have been a false policy, and of course it failed. But nonetheless, the chase after, what we would say, the accomplished facts, and it happens all over, although it didn't happen in Afghanistan. There wasn't the same level of enthusiasm to support the Taliban at that time because people could see what they represented. And the left needs to be more critical of Hamas and what they represent. Hamas was formed around 1987 from the Muslim Brotherhood, which itself began in Egypt in 1927. And the Muslim Brotherhood is a right-wing, pro-capitalist, landlord section of the Muslim population which tries to prevent the advance of socialism, tries to prevent the advance of secular Arab nationalism. So it's a reactionary, the Muslim Brotherhood, a reactionary rival movement within Islam. And Hamas came from that group. In fact, the leadership of Hamas, the Shura, um, the Shura uh, Committee, as it's called, is in Damascus. It's not even in uh, Gaza or in Palestine. It's an, and Hamas is an internationalist movement who has the aim not only of converting the entire territory of what used to be brief mandate Palestine into an Islamic state, they have internationalist aims to convert the entire globe into uh, Islamic states. So when we're discussing Hamas, we need to consider that. They won an election back in 2006. Now, they stood in that election with the PLO for a common Palestinian uh, authority. Then 
they broke with that authority and established themselves separately, as a separate uh, governing body in Gaza, and kicked the PLO out of Gaza. Incidentally, the PLO and Fatah and the present leadership of Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority shows the complete failure of that group, the PLO, to solve the problems that Palestinians face. Not only are they ineffective, they work very closely with the Israeli security services in uh, the West Bank, and they're also guilty of corruption. That's 15 all... minutes, Vince. Sorry? 15 minutes, yeah. Yeah, okay, thanks, Pam. So the Hamas emerged from that disillusionment with um, PLO and Fatah. Now, a point I want to just uh, talk about as well is the role of the historic role of imperialism and colonialism in this situation. The Sykes Pico Agreement, as it was called at the end of World War I, made promises to the Arabs, leaders of the Arab states, who fought with Britain against uh, Germany. Turkey made the mistake of joining the Germans in the war, so the Ottoman Empire was defeated, and all the countries that were in around in the uh, Ottoman Empire were all parcelled out by the victors, British imperialism and French imperialism in particular. So Britain got Mesopotamia, which became uh, Iraq. The French got uh, Lebanon and Syria, although there was a lot of fighting going on there, but who got what? The Hashemite leaders, which was a tribal uh, aristocratic leadership, of the Arabs, were promised they could set up a whole new empire if they fought with the British against the Turks. And they were expecting to form an empire of Arab states based in Damascus, led, of course, by them. But when the war ended, none of that happened. So Britain got its peace, France got its peace, but the Hashemites, first of all, they lost the Arabian Peninsula. That was given to the uh, Abdelaziz, uh, Saud, the Saudi family, which were... Uh, uh, a Bedouin group in the Saudi Peninsula. The Hashemites expected to get that. They didn't. And then one branch of the Hashemites got Iraq, and another branch got Jordan, which, what became Jordan. It was called Transjordan originally because it was the other side of the Jordan. So the treachery of British and French imperialism is behind a lot of what's happening as well. They made promises to the Jew, Jewish population. The Balfour Declaration, which was made in 1917, promised a homeland or home for Jews. It didn't say there'd be a Jewish state. It didn't do anything of that nature. It just said, reasonably enough, that there's a place, there has to be a place where Jews can live safely. Don't forget that we never do forget the horrific uh, experiences of Jews across the world. It's not just the Holocaust that people often refer back to, particularly in Europe. I mean, in a lot of countries. I mean, in England, there was a, the, a, the Jewish population of York was wiped out in the 12th century, the entire Jewish population. In Fez in northern Morocco, 6,000 Jews were massacred. In Spain, in Granada, Jews were massacred. There were constant pogroms and massacres in Russia and the countries of Eastern Europe. And then the Holocaust was the culmination. And of course, in France, the Dreyfus Affair was a horrific uh, illustration of the uh, hostility towards Jews. So, it's not um, unusual that a, uh, an organization to, to, to the Jews would feel vulnerable. So Herzl, as you come as again, will be familiar with it, close to the 19th century, set up uh, the group uh, Zionism, which was uh, quite unpopular. It didn't have any mass support, particularly amongst young people, because he thought a resolution of the Jewish problem, and I've given some illustrations as to where it might have originated, the problem that the Jews had to experience, um, the young people wanted to solve the problem in their own countries. The most uh, Jewish people joined uh, socialist and communist organizations to fight against uh, capitalism and against oppression in their own countries. Incidentally, Herzl uh, suggested that the Jews might go to Argentina and form their own state in Argentina. The British suggested Uganda as an interim measure to solve the Jewish question. But of course, it's not as simple as that. There is a historic link between Jewish traditions and literature and culture with uh, what we now call the, the Middle East and Palestine. That's not to say you can just walk in there and take the land over, which is actually what happened. The British, the British mandate Palestine, there was no decision made about uh, that area. So even though there was a state in Iraq, Lebanon and Syria, there was no Palestinian state. And that was given to the British to have a mandate over it until such time as the issue was resolved. The issue was not resolved, and there was a lot of violence and conflict, particularly Arab 
people's Palestinian peoples objecting to the land being bought up by um, you know Jewish people and uh, incidentally the leadership of the Palestinian people at that time was aristocratic and held by a couple of families. The one of them, the Nashash Abbeys, one of them was called the Mufti of Jerusalem, and he uh, supported Hitler uh, in the war, supported Nazis in the war. So the, the failure of leadership meant that the Palestinians didn't have any leadership. But of course, the Haganah and the Irgun, which also has a very questionable origin in supporting uh, fascism in Germany, these two armed groups fought to establish a state of Israel. And eventually, in 1947, the United Nations decided to partition the land of, as it was then, Palestine, and to allocate something like 55% to an Israeli state, which has now become 78% given the takeovers and the annexations that the Israeli government is pursuing. But the Arab uh, states then decided to invade Israel at its foundation. None of them recognized or accepted the United Nations Declaration. And inevitably, that leads to an ongoing conflict which has lasted from 1947. The Arab population were kicked out of 500 villages and three quarters of a million uh, Palestinians were driven out of the... Uh, the, the uh, lands that they had lived in historically, that's called the Nakba. And uh, that's known by Palestinians as the Nakba, the catastrophe. And I think that, or I suspect, one of the reasons why Palestinians are reluctant to move, even in Gaza, is that they're not to come back to, and the land could well be annexed again and made part of the Israeli state. So there's lots of complications that affect people. But getting back to this question of leadership, none of the organizations that have been thrown up have been successful in defending the interests of the Palestinian people, not the PLO, uh, not the Arab states. In fact, a lot of people believed, a lot of Palestinians believed that they could rely on the Palestinian states. These are the states like Egypt, sorry, not the Palestinian, the Arab states, sorry. They thought they could rely on the Arab states, such as Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Morocco, other places, to defend them. But no, in, in fact, the, the PLO attitude at the time well, a bit later, but the PLO attitude was that uh, we'll start the uh, the fighting, but the big Arab states will win it for us. None of that happened. So what's missing now is uh, a leadership that's capable of resolving the problems, and that can only be done by a source of leadership. Now, during my visit uh, to um, Palestine uh, a few years ago, we saw ourselves the horrors that people have to live through. We went into refugee camps. We had discussions with uh, Arab uh, organizations, with Jewish organizations. We met a group called the Breaking the Silence, which is uh, a Jewish uh, ex-members of the Israeli army who formed a group and publicized materials and photographs and exhibitions showing the horrors that they inflicted on people during their time in the army. And you can see then the destruction of buildings, the arrests, the harassment that the army carried out. And these are army people themselves recognizing the... Uh, incorrect uh, policies that have been pursued by the government. We met B'Tselem, which is a Jewish or an Israeli human rights organization based in the occupied territories and to defend the interests of the Palestinian citizens. We then met, uh, we went into one of the settlements and had a, these were all open discussions. We met one of these settlers and um, the, the settlements, uh, they're not like refugee camps or uh, itinerant camps on the side of the road. These are towns and cities. The biggest of them is 50,000 population. They have shops, malls, like any other city. They have industries that operate in these areas. And they're in higher uh, locations that are looking down on uh, the Palestinians. There's a wall, as Carmen's are familiar with, 700 kilometers of a wall going right through Palestinian territory, dividing farmers from their lands, the, uh, causing tremendous difficulties in terms of access uh, in and other places. There's a lot of workers leave Bethlehem every day to work in Jerusalem. And they go through this uh, cage and a checkpoint for hours. So we went there to meet people. And they're like cattle pens. They're forced through kind of shoots of uh, wire and uh, netting where they're subject to the security uh, machines at five o'clock in the morning. And it goes on for hours and hours. And then they have to come back again. So that's the condition that people have to live in. And we saw all of that. And I mentioned the example of Hebron. Now, there is a trade union federation amongst Palestinians. It's the uh, it's called the 
Palestine Trade Union uh, Federation. And it should be the focus of any kind of development of left-wing policies amongst Palestinians. There is a union in Israel, the history that, but it's got a terrible record because uh, historically they supported the Jewish agency and they were opposed to Arabs in some areas getting work, which they believe properly belonged to Jewish people. They supported the colonization uh, of, uh, of Palestine. But nonetheless, it's a trade union and that they uh, do have um, you know, a lot of links. Uh, they set up a Palestinian section. They didn't want Arabs to join the Hisodot, which they saw as an exclusively Jewish organization, and they formed Palestinian unions, but that's beginning to change. But nonetheless, whether there's to be a new union federation or whether Hisodot can be transformed, maybe it can be, but that's the only way the situation can be resolved in terms of Israel as well. Israel is a very unequal society. There's tremendous divisions of living standards and poverty, and the settlement uh, process solves that problem to some extent for the Israeli government. So instead of providing for people, uh, providing people with jobs and providing for proper living standards, they say, look, go and live in this settlement and we get all kinds of grants and facilities to help you to live out there. And they export the problem from Israel's responsibility and take it out on the Arabs who have to lose their land and their facilities and have roads and walls built across where they previously lived. But nonetheless, if there is to be any resolution of this problem, it has to be by linking the workers of Palestine and Israel into single organizations. And it has to spread beyond even these areas and must include also other countries, Egypt, Lebanon, Syria. And some of these uh, countries have really strong left-wing histories of uh, left-wing groups. But whatever the past failings has been, we have to start now to work towards the building of a class position amongst workers who are Jews and Palestinians and, as I said, Egyptians. They have, they have to come together, firstly, as workers, as tragedians, as activists, and also then in socialist organizations similarly. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of discussion about the one state and two state solution. Now, it's not a matter for us to decide which is the better. But the, um, the, neither of them, uh, as they're presented in the capitalist media, are clear uh, examples of how to get out of this situation. The, the two-state solution is seems to be impossible to implement because the Israeli government, by building settlements all the way across the West Bank, makes it well now impossible to create uh, a unified uh, country on its own. But it is possible to have a unified state which brings together Jews and Palestinians into a single unified state with guaranteed human rights and guaranteed facilities for democratic uh, freedoms. Now, many countries have national minorities within them, many of them. So it wouldn't be unusual to create a country with different national interests combining in the defense of uh, human rights and democratic rights. So a one-state solution, which brings together Jews and Arabs into a unified democratic socialist state is one way out, and the two-state solution is another way. Now, it's not up to us to decide which, which uh, it's more appropriate, but we do need to examine the socialist aspect of all of the uh, discussions that we have in that regard. So whatever problems are national, ethnic, religious, or whatever the divisions are in society, they can only be resolved by means of a socialist uh, answer, where the means of production, distribution, exchange are in common ownership, where human rights and labour rights are guaranteed, where all the freedoms that... Uh, are possible, can be uh, developed and made available and facilitated uh, so people can exercise and live their lives to the full in a free and open way. So all the solutions that have been proposed by Hamas, by uh, other groups, by PLO, are all incapable of solving the problems. Even the um, Israel can't win uh, this battle either, but Gaza, it could go on for donkey's use. None of them have any, any solution to the problem at all. And I'll finish on that point, and we need to examine it carefully. A way in which we can bring together, or certainly advocate, the coming together of labour and trade union organisations across the entire Middle East to create a socialist federation of countries of the Middle East, also of North Africa, and of Western Asia, where they all have common traditions and uh, common um, experiences against the colonial interests, against their own ruling class. Thank you, comrades. 
Thanks very much, Finn. Um, right, I'll invite contribution. I'm going to ask everybody for the time being to keep the contributions to five minutes because we have got quite a good attendance today. So if you could do that as best as you can, please, and then we'll just see how the time goes. So can I take Peter Sinclair first, please? Thanks, Bon. Um, first, let me make it perfectly clear. I'm totally against war. I'm totally against oppression. And I don't care where either one of them comes from. The only way this can be stopped isn't by workers, uh, collective or otherwise, trying to persuade ultra right wing governments like Netanyahu and Hamas. Um, but let's make this clear too. The latest spin by Israel is that its action is that it wants to remove Hamas from Palestine. But Hamas wasn't founded until 1987. So what was the reason for the persecution of the Palestinians for the 39 years previously? Did you know a Jewish state couldn't have happened without the Zionists occupying Palestine? Being persecuted and uh, dispossessed, murder and destruction. Likewise, Hamas wouldn't have been created without the Zionists. It was the Zionists themselves that's created this problem in Israel. And how we can solve it? Firstly, we've got to stop the two warmongering countries in the world, USA and England, from providing these monsters with weapons. That's the first thing. Then we have to be aware that Israel have breached more UN resolutions against them than any other country, all of the other countries put together. One tiny little state. It's not a war. Call it what it is. It's genocide and it commenced in 1948 and it's still going on today. Yet, we have the UK and the USA supplying weapons of destruction and death to these people, arming them up to the hill as if they already needed to be armed because, as we all know, Israel is a very militaristic country. They've been persecuting Palestinians for many, many decades. That is a matter of absolute fact. It seems the only thing that the Zionists learned from the Holocaust was how to brutalize people. As far as I'm concerned, Nazism and Zionism are very much alike. Who's next? The religious Jews? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Peter. Uh, Karen. Thanks, Pam. Thank you, Finbar, for the introduction, which is excellent. Five minutes is very short, Pam, so just, just jump in and stop me, because I'm sure I'll hit five minutes quick. You know, it'll seem very quick. Uh, I'm speaking from Belfast in, in Ireland, uh, and in Belfast, their Palestinian flags are flying in the Catholic areas, and Israeli flags are flying in Protestant areas, because here the communities identify with the two sides in the Middle East as they understand it. And there, there are reasons why, clear historical analogies about the dispossession of people from their land and who then possesses the land. And the and the conflict in the Middle East, 75 years, 100 years old, here is 400 years old uh, and goes back further. And, and it is ultimately, we, we know about the machinations of British imperialism. Uh, I, and I fully accept that. But we have to deal with the situation as it is before us today in 2023, uh, which means we need to be careful about our words, about our slogans, and about our overall approach. Uh, so, for example, you know, Peter's analogy between Zionism and Nazism, you know, I, I mean, I don't agree that that's a helpful way to pose the issue. And there are many ways in which the issue is posed by the left are not helpful. We, we need to be careful and think it through and to, look, and to keep our heads when others are losing theirs. And there have been times in, in, in Ireland and Northern Ireland where it seemed that the situation was slipping out of control uh, and that the idea that working class unity uh, or a class alternative could provide a solution just seemed fanciful uh, or just seemed, you know, for the birds. And it must seem that way at, at the present time, both in Israel and in Gaza and the wider Arab world, where everyone has to choose a side and there only are two sides. And we have to point out that choosing either side, that, that dichotomy between as Peter did say, but right-wing right regimes uh, and the armed forces, the right-wing regimes, it will, will deliver nothing for ordinary working-class people on either side uh, of the Gaza border or, or any of the other artificial borders of the region. 
Now, we, we, we were opposed to the Marxists were opposed to the creation of the state of Israel, but three generations later, it, it does exist. Uh, and a very large Jewish Israeli population in the region uh, who, who aren't going anywhere. Which, which does mean, bring me to the question of slogans and the very large demonstrations that took place yesterday in Ireland, in Britain, uh, across Europe. There were large demonstrations, but the demonstrations were often under the, the slogan Free Palestine, which sounds like a obvious slogan to adopt, uh, or this, the chant of from the Jordan to the sea, Palestine will be free. And we, we need to think about slogans and their content and what they mean because the content of those slogans can only mean the destruction of the state of Israel. And we're in, in favour of the state of Israel, destruction of the state of Israel in one sense, in that it's a, it's a capitalist entity, uh, and we're in the favour of all capitalist states ultimately being, being uh, swept away and the socialist reconstruction. But before that slogan in the present period can only mean uh, the, the destruction of the Jewish people. That's what it means to everyone. Uh, and we have to step aside from such a, uh, a slogan. A more appropriate slogan for the left might be freedom for Palestinians as opposed to free Palestine, because the Palestinian people have the right uh, to be free of oppression and the right to self-determination. The question is, how will that be How will that be achieved? So if, comrades, if we were a group of comrades in Gaza now, what, what would our proposals be? What would our slogans be? We would have to be opposed to the Hamas regime. We would have to be in favour of the building of workers' organisations, both political trade union, but also military, military organizations, the working class. We would be absolutely in favor of self-defense. And self-defense sometimes includes the right to offense uh, in, in the sense of opposing oppression by whatever means uh, or whatever tactics are appropriate to the circumstance. But that wouldn't mean that we would give carte blanche to the actions of the Hamas regime and the actions over the course of the last week. Those all tactics are relative and tactics can be counterproductive. And the tactics of the last week which are driven by despair uh, and, and driven by a sense of nihilism uh, and by a particular reading of fundamentalist Islam are counterproductive, uh, both in the region and internationally. Uh, and, and we have to say that, you know, we're, we're not neutral on that, just like we're not neutral on the actions of the Israeli state. If we were a group of comrades in the Israeli state, what would we call for? We would have to call for resolute opposition to the actions of the state. We'd have to call for independent workers' organizations to act against the war machine. We would have to call for soldiers to disobey their orders and not to cross the border, not to cross the border into Gaza. And we would do all of that knowing that we were a small, isolated group and that our message would not immediately land or have a large audience. But we would also know from our experience of, of, of wars internationally that that audience would grow in time. Because when the Israeli state does go into Gaza, it will suffer heavy casualties. I mean, that's, that's a given. And it suffers casualties then at a certain point in time. Many of the soldiers will draw the necessary conclusions, as will the, the, the Israeli population. So it's, it's very, it's very complex, and it's very, it is very difficult for, for Marxists to orientate in this situation. And just the final point I would make is that the point that uh, Finbar made about it's not, it's not for us to say whether it should be a one-state solution or a two-state solution. And I understand what Finbar is saying. It's, it's not for us to impose our solutions on others. But I, I think there is a, a very distinct difference between the two-state solution and the one-state solution in the sense of our tactics uh, uh, and, and our understanding of how to reach wider layers of the masses. Because of the absolute separation of the Israeli working class and the Palestinian working class in, in most places, most arenas, including in the trade unions, uh, the idea of a single-state solution at the moment would, would not get an echo amongst anything but a, a very tiny minority of the Jewish working class or the wider Jewish population. Uh, and similarly, I think there are many within the Palestinian population who would see a one-state solution or, tra or treated with suspicion at the present time. If we want to reach a wider audience, we have to pose the question of a two-state solution, self-determination for both Palestinian masses and for the Israeli working class and the Israeli people side by side, but, but only in the context of uh, of, of socialism. We know that there is no solution on capitalism. And we would hope that the two-state solution would be a stepping stone to greater integration over time and the time of federation and time of a single state. But the only way to get to that point is to propose the is to propose the, the possibility of a two-state solution. Now the obvious problem with that slogan is that everything has moved and shifted and changed over the last 20, 25, 30 years in terms of the settlement, the settlement program. So we would have to say a two-state solution is now only viable in the context of Israeli settlers being removed uh, from huge swathes of the West Bank 
uh, and uh, the city of Jerusalem was a two-state solution would only be, is only viable on the basis of borders that no longer exist, the borders of 20 or 30 years ago. So it would require a certain movement of population. But we have to raise these demands in this way. Uh, we, we, we can never be certain how it has to apply out, but I think we need to consider the two-state solution still, in my opinion, has been the way to reach a wider audience and a one-state solution uh, would, makes it much more difficult to reach a wider audience. Thanks, comrade. Thank you, Kieran. Matthew. All right, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, and uh, you know, um, it's a it's a timely discussion. Um, I think there's a few things. I, some of the things that comrades have before the, the, the comparison between between the current state of Zionism in Israel and Nazism and the methods of repression is a live one in Israel itself. It's not not something that's that's, that's un, unknown or is or is you know seen as as alien. And there are actually people within the Israeli government who described themselves as fascists. You know that's where we got. That's where we are. Um, you know they actually openly describe themselves as, as fascists. Um, so uh, some of the other things that said uh, the uh, just as a as an incidental the the Mufti of Jerusalem who who supported. Uh, the, 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 the Nazis in the 30s was actually imposed by the British. There was actually an election. Um, he lost and the British imposed him. So it wasn't as if the, 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 the masses actually supported his positions. They didn't. Um, the Histadrut is, is a racist organisation. It was set up as such as a Zionist trade union for, for, against uh, uh, Palestinian work workers to drive Palestinians out. That, that's the basis of it in which it was founded in which it still exists. That's the problem we've got with it. Um, Gaza is, is, is essentially um, the world's largest concentration camp. And we only look at it like that. I mean, people are deprived in Gaza, deprived by Israeli, under Israeli policy, not, not by accident, but by policy of adequate food, clean water, building materials, um, you know, communications, uh, medical supplies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so for, you know, to, to have people break out of that camp, I mean, the people, you know, surely that, that, that's what you would expect. You would expect a resistance. You would expect people to break out of that, out of that uh, horrible condition. Uh, and and for, 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 for the sort of thing that happened, it did happen, you know. Uh, and the problem is, of course, also, of course, there's a lot of lies about it. I mean, all this nonsense about beheading babies, of course, is bullshit. Um, and I think that really, you know, we, we need to be very careful about some of the claims that so and so that, 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 that have been made in those terms. Um, I think that the, the thing is also is to look at, say, you know, the nature of the Israeli state um, as, as a principal uh, key stronghold of imperialism in the Middle East, which is why the imperialists support it, which is why Israel, uh, you know, Israel's prime backer is the US. And then, of course, Britain. Britain actually, you know, it, the whole sort of network of, of, of British interest in the Middle East is, 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 you know, Israel is central to that. Um, so, I mean, this is, this is, you know, why, obviously, we get the situation where Joe Biden's administration has essentially come out and said that they will support Israel in, in committing a genocide in Gaza. You know, that is the key. And then, of course, all the all the imperialist satraps and lickspittles and all these people at Sunak, Sam, Starmer, Macron, all these other characters all turn up and, and, and hold their hand up as well. You know, I mean, it is, it's, it, 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 it's just it's just killing. You know, I mean, all this stuff about laws and so on and so forth, they obviously throw the whole thing out the window. Um, I think it's all, you know, it's also the, the other thing you can say in terms of history of, 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 of the organization of Hamas. Hamas, of course, is, is the basic Palestine, Palestine branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. But it was actually set up with the assistance of the, Amer Israel, of the Shin Bet, the Israeli political police, as a means of splitting the PLO in the 80s. You know, that's its history. That's not obviously what, what it is now, nor would you say that any of those people who took part in the breakout from Gaza were anything to do with, with, with the Israeli political police. However, that, that, that's where it comes from. Um, I think that the, the, 
the, the point is also in turn we, we look at this in terms of the crisis of of imperialism itself you know under conditions in which clearly the us is losing the war in ukraine and we're under conditions in which Israeli society, actually, as we can see over the last uh, last number of months, you know, has been falling apart. You know, you've had this massive strike wave, of course, opposed by Hister Drut. Hister Drut attempted to stop it. The workers walked off the job anyway. We've had near on general strikes in 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 in, in Israel um, against Netanyahu, and that, that, that actually, you know, this is the background to to to, to this move. You know the fact that the Israeli government is has a substantial fascist element in it, that, that, that this government is ab absolutely desperate. That, that Netanyahu himself wishes to avoid being imprisoned for his corruption, uh, which is naked and known to everybody. Um, that you know, uh, uh, using this as a, as a method. And obviously, the the, the 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 issue is that, of course, you know, the the the, the whole of the, of, of the Zionist policy. Of, of the people you know who technically are supposed to re to represent quote the opposition in that split, all of course now support Netanyahu in the killing of the, the mass killing of Gazans uh, and of Pal Palestinians generally. I mean, obviously there's the, 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 there are efforts to kill lives of the people in the West Bank also. Um, so in those terms, it's 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 it, 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 it's it's then of that uh, as I say of the crisis both locally and 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 internationally. Plus, of course, added to that, the fact that the U.S. administration now is in is is, is near prostrate because it it actually the Congress is locked up. They haven't got a speaker. They can't actually pass appropriations for money. Um, so the the, the 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 you know it shows you the depth of the crisis of imperialism and of politics generally. Um, you know, the, the, and, and this is part of it. The problem for the problem for us really is to say, right, okay, well, how do we get this stopped? How do we get this stopped? The fact that there is a mass killing, you know, being being conducted by the by the the, the imperialists nakedly in front of us. You know, um, we 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 must support the, the 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 demonstrations. We must support all protests against this. We must get this stopped. You know, um, we cannot. We should not. Um, have any uh, any uh, uh, illusion in that? The other, the other thing, of course, is that I mean the the, the 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 slogan "Free Palestine" or the slogan from the river to the sea, "Palestine will free will be free." is not anti-Jewish. It's not an anti-Semitic slogan. It's to say, well, we will get rid of the state of Israel, and there'll be a state for everyone. That's that's what it means. That's why the, if you go on the demonstrations, I mean, the, the, you know, you you have Jewish people speaking. You know, you have support. You know, for, for, from anti-Zionist Jews. So there's a principal uh, platform of, 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 of the Palestine solidarity movement in, in, in this country, and, and, and it, you know, that is Britain. Also in the US, so actually where there's a very, probably even more substantial section of the Jewish community is now coming out against Zionism. Um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's really very, very important that that, that, that is now happening. Um, you know, and in those terms, I think this this is the real priority. To say, right, you know, we we must stop this 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 mass killing. We must stop the effort to try. Matthew, and Matthew you've had a good fight. From you from, 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 from you know the the, the, the concentration of camp, camp of Gaza. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Matthew. You have a chance to come back in later. Uh, right, Joel. Where's Joel? Joel. Joel has indicated. Are you still here, Joel? Just having a look for you. Uh, is Joel still Okay, here? there it is. Yeah, there. Oh, there. I've seen you now. Tec technical okay, hello. Difficulties. <laughs> That's okay. Hi. Hi. Yeah, um, Joel Shaw from the United States here. Um, Finn's comments about what he was talking about, how the left, the Marxist groups supported... Afghanistan. I don't know if he was talking about the 1970s when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. Um, I know in the United States here, a lot of the Marxist groups, um, well, he said that they did not support the Taliban, sorry, in, in uh, Ireland. But in the United States, I wasn't on the left at that time. That I was just coming into the world. But as I understand it, a lot of the Marxist, the Trotskyist groups, did support the Taliban 
in the 1970s and the 80s when the Soviet Union invaded. And um, there were very few that saw through it. Um, I was just going to make that comment. And the last speaker, Matthew, um, really got to something I was thinking about with the strikes that had happened in Israel. I am... Um, a few, and it, there was some news about it. If you just look at the news cycle, it's almost like that's never happened. It's very much like we're re history is being rewritten, and they're using this um, was this the this uh, in these atrocities now to cover up. It reminds me of sort of what happened after nine eleven in the United States, where there was this big. Uh, a lot of people were getting mobilized about unions and um, what was going on with the international financial institutions. There was a lot of protests against what people called uh, globalization, more or less capitalism. And then right after 9-11, all that stopped and George Bush became a hero. Um, but... I was going to say something about that, and uh, the last speaker got to most of it. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks very much, uh, Joel. Uh, Temos, next. Well, um, first of all, um, it's uh, certainly no, no, none of us could, prop, could possibly support Hamas or support its actions in, in, in this way. The tragedy is that the Palestinian people do support these actions, and they do vote for Hamas not because of uh, of anything else, but because of despair, because of the fact that they are abandoned, because they don't, uh, they, they they have no they have they have no possible solution, and I don't think we can offer them a, a solution or how to how to face the situation. They cannot do that. All the Arab world, the Arab world has, has abandoned them. The, all the civilized world is is behaving in the most uncivilized way in Palestine. They support Israel's every genocidal action, and they they see this as the only ray, ray of hope, a false one. But there it is. It's it's something that we have to uh, to bring out very clearly. So in, in my in my view, the only thing we can do is to is to uh, uh, to appeal to the Jewish people, and it's there that we have to find uh, some way of of supporting the Palestinians because unless there is a Jewish reaction against this, unless there is a, a more general uh, reaction from the Western world. Uh, there is no possibility of doing anything else, and, and there is a gain for the Jewish people if they act, for, act on it, if they demand for Israel to 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 uh, to stop the uh, the massacre, if they ask it to stop the attack on Gaza, because if they don't, if, if we have a, a more a, another uh, clearing of of half of Gaza and annexation to Israel as a punishment for Hamas. What will happen? Hamas will and will will be supported even more, and terrorism will become the mode of action of these people. And, and quite honestly, I I don't feel we have the moral right to condemn these things. I mean, Hamas is the equivalent of Taliban. I mean, there is no question. And, uh, but 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 that's where we are, we are pushing the Palestinians. If they don't have our support and the support of the people of Israel and the support of, 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 the, of the rest of the civilized world, that, that's where it's going to end. And, and this is going to be more and more the case, not only in Israel, but in, in place after place after place. I mean, to take a, a very different example, Syriza was uh, was uh, crushed by the European bureaucracy in in in, uh, in 20, 2015. What happened after that? The right came to power. The extreme right is gaining ground, 
and we are we are moving in, in, in towards very quickly towards fascist solutions and in this sense i think we should uh, we should uh, we should be very very careful not to tell the palestinians what to do they cannot do anything the whole uh, the, the whole uh, uh, military machine of israel and the west is crushing them we cannot expect anything from from them we have to expect much more from the people of Israel, from the people of the West, from the people of the civilized world. Thanks very much, Tamos. Uh, Jan, next. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. I would like to start with uh, a big thanks to Finn because I think he had a very good lead off. And he put the finger where it should be put. Uh, there was a meeting in my hometown, Ume in the north of Sweden, yesterday. And the slogans that was put forward was the same slogan, slogans that uh, the socialist or communist left have been put forward since 19... 73, which means in 50, five zero years. Completely useless. Uh, this is not a competition about who is worst, the Israeli army or Hamas. The creation of Israel was an imperialist move. But what, what we are fighting for is a solution of this imperialist move. And we are humans like everybody else, although we call ourselves Marxists, or I do. But nevertheless, I mean, our goal is to find and point out a way forward and uh, a way we, we, we do not serve the Palestinians by being just another uh, voice who tells how bad the situation is. The situation is bad. And it will get even worse. This will probably be a new Nakba, like in 1948. But nevertheless, what use are we if we don't point a way forward? And that way forward, PLO and Fatah couldn't lead. Hamas. Well, if they succeed, there will be a Sharia state like Iran, a religious dictatorship. I mean, Hamas is not the way forward. And I think that even, even if, <laughs> if the solution is very hard to... Uh, to argue uh, for a class position, as Finn did. We have to do that. Because um, from 1948 up until uh, 2023, there has been, the, the Palestinians have been treated very bad, but also during the same time, the Palestinians have had a leadership who have not been able to solve the crisis. And the regimes in Egypt, the regimes in Jordan, the regimes in Syria, the, regime, the regimes in Iraq, so forth, so on, have not been able, because they are also corrupt. They are also the enemy of the Palestinian people. The regimes, if there has, if there 
has been a case of talking about the revolution against the state of Israel, against the state of Iraq, Syria, Egypt, Jordan, and so on and so forth. It is in this region. It is very, very unlikely that there can be a solution with the present regimes. But that's one thing to say. But we have to have a position to put. And I think the, that the position that Finn put, a class position, with the Palestinian Trade Union Federation as uh, a starting point is the right, even if it looks far away. So, I mean, look, if we go back to 1973, if we listen to the slogans that was, was put forward in f 50 years ago, I mean, what solution, what, 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 what meaning is this possible to repeat slogans as a strategy for a way forward that was bad in 1973? To repeat them today in 2023, is there any, any possible uh, way to defend this? No, it's not. Hamas, PLU didn't have the solution, Hamas didn't have the solution, and we have to say that. Uh, by the way, Sharia isn't a solution, even is, if uh, Hamas would be successful. Would, would anybody be better off with a Hamas a religious uh, dictatorship? Nobody would be better off. So, I think Finn made his point. And I think also I would like to end with uh, saying that to punish the Israeli state for its big crimes that will be even bigger tomorrow by putting forward slogans like it's, a, it, it, it's a Zionism and Nazism reminds about one another is a very bad move. It's completely uh, against any class position. And you have for five minutes now. I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm finished. You finished. That's great. Thank you very much. Right, Dave Buxton, you're next. Thank you. Um, would it be wrong to ask a question? Why did the IDF? Uh, Israeli Defence Force take so long to respond to the Hamas attacks? Was it because Hamas had knocked out all of the IDF surveillance equipment in on the border area? Um, and if that was true, what about the Israeli Air Force, which were not based on that border area? They Once they'd seen that their um, ability to monitor the Gaza Air, border area had gone I would have imagined they would have sent aircraft there immediately and would have been fully aware of what was going on so my question is given all the problems that Net Netanyahu has been facing over the preceding months um, is it wrong to say that he allowed the military to delay going in there and combating Hamas because he knew that if that was the, allowed whatever was to take place, and I'm not saying he knew of the extent of what would take place, but he knew that if Hamas did perform this sort of operation, then it would bring people behind him in some sort of a war effort against against the, the Palestinians. And I, I think that's something that has to be considered. So if those Israelis are mad some of them are mad at uh, of the, at his cabinet. There's a justification for that, I would say, in t terms of how long it took. But this, it's not the main thing I wanted to say. It seems that that's something that needs to be considered. It's not the main question. Uh, Syrian, I hope I've pronounced your name right, says we have to have the right slogans, which I agree with. And Finbar says that we don't have the right to impose a one or a two state solution. Now, Apologies if I'm using the wrong language, but I think 
Finbar's comment is a cop out myself. I think we have to decide, is it possible to have a two state solution with the direction that Israel has taken under Zionism for the past 70 years, or is it not? And it seems to me it's absolutely, there's no prospect at all of a two state solution because there wouldn't be Palestinian states. They would be Bantu stands along the South African model, allowing them some sort of, uh, on the face of it, freedom, but with huge restrictions on how they operate. They'd just be uh, ineffective uh, and they'd be oppressed in all sorts of ways. And so on the question of slogans, I think it's right to say that Israel is an apartheid state. And therefore, if it's an apartheid state, do we agree that it should continue as this sort of model of one state and these Bantu stands. I think we disagree. And it's logical, therefore, that a one, some form of one state solution is the answer. And I think it's, it's political cowardice not to say that, even if it's unpopular with many Israelis and many Palestinians. And this might sound like I'm a communist stagist, that we must have the democratic revolution first and then the socialist revolution. But I actually think that's that makes sense. If we argue for we need a one democratic state in Palestine, Israel, then we should also be saying, but that doesn't go far enough. But it's a starting point. If we had that, because Israel likes to say they're a democracy, well, if they're a democracy, then why have they got this racism towards the Arabs? Let's have proper democracy, which is a one-state, multi-ethnic uh, or religious state, and, and argue for that, but argue beyond that to say that that ultimately will not provide uh, any real solution. And... And um, yeah, so that that's my argument, basically. I think that we should, uh, um, and sorry, I was at a meeting on Zoom this morning, a political meeting, and I heard of a new book called One State, The Only Democratic Future for Palestine Israel. Now, the person who spoke, the author, didn't really talk about the book that much. It was more about a political discussion but it was advertised and I'm certainly going to read that book. And it seemed to me over many years prior to this, I thought, well, why do we keep saying a two state solution in Palestine, Israel? It didn't make any sense to me. And then people on the left would say, oh, we've got no right to impose. We're not imposing anything. We're saying, all right, how do we get out of this morass that we're in? So that's why I'm for that. And the, the other thing that came from the meeting, I'll finish on this, that, um, the person who runs the program, not the Andrew Marshall, played a de uh, Ger Gerard Kaufman MP speech from about 15 years ago, where he basically was attacking um, Israel. And I just want to read out these couple of paragraphs. My, and he said, my grandmother, and he's a Zionist Jewish MP, was, sorry, he's dead now. My grandmother did not die to provide cover for Israeli soldiers murdering Palestinian grandmothers in Gaza. The current Israeli government ruthlessly and cynically exploit the continuing guilt among Gentiles over the slaughter of Jews in the Holocaust as justification for their murder of Palestinians. The implication is that Jewish lives are precious, but the lives of Palestinians do not count. Uh, on Sky News a few days ago, the spokesman... Dave, you've had to go five minutes now, I'm afraid. It's the last, just the last sentence. Okay. The, the, on Sky News a few days ago, the spokeswoman for the Israeli army, army Major Lebovich, was asked about the Israeli killing at that time of 800 Palestinians. The total is now 1,000. She replied instantly that 500 of them were militants. So what was said then is is, is even more extreme now. We're in a, pro a, a, a propaganda war by Israeli that they're going to lie through their teeth to justify the obliteration of Gaza and driving the Gazans out of, out of the Palestinian lands. And I think we need to have better ideas than some of the ideas that have been discussed here. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, John or Dominic? Both coming. Both. Both, 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 both of us watch our show. Uh, yeah, one after the other. 
I just wanted to come back to this question of Hamas and the sort of hint that we should be supporting it. I think there's there's no way in the world you, you should support that. I think even the Arab people who are, who are celebrating it in, in Gaza and elsewhere are doing it against a background of persecution where the, the Arab population, the Palestinians, have been under the heel of a real and vicious regime for, for since 19, what is it, 47. The thing that struck me and brought the, the thing home about the treatment of the Palestinians was a, a report that I got back from a friend of ours who was in, she was on a visit with the Labour Friends of Palestine. And in their travels, they were in a queue at the border to cross. And up in that queue was a woman with a sick child who had appendicitis. And they were stuck there for two hours. And the guards wouldn't let anybody through, wouldn't let her through, or wouldn't even take the child from her and stick her in an ambulance and take her to an Israeli hospital. The child died. And it just seemed to be a normal day. There wasn't riots, there wasn't anything, there wasn't any panic among the security guards. And you can understand, given that background, why people are going to cheer when the same happens to uh, Jews by Hamas. Doesn't mean to say it's right, doesn't mean to say that they're going to think that in two years' time or next week. But that's the sort of mood that's there, and I think it's something you've got to understand. And the other thing, these are bits and pieces, but what's his name? Netanyahu is reported by an Egyptian security officer to have had a conversation with him the week before, you know, about the Wednesday before the Hamas attack started, that there was real trouble brewing in Gaza and something big was going to happen. And Netanyahu said, no, that's not true. Nothing's going to happen. Now, either the, either the man's absolutely stupid or he's got his own ideas of what should happen. Because what happened with Hamas has given Netanyahu the opportunity in Israel with the support of a unity government and mass support for uh, at attacking Hamas. And that includes, obviously, the, the population of Gaza. To, to, to wreak absolute havoc. And if you look at the, the uh, Al Jazeera and see the condition that parts of Gaza are in, they're talking about, the Israelis talk about precision bombing, it's carpet bombing. They're just doing it location by location. The north of Gaza, I think when the troops go in, the first thing uh, some guy was reporting on, on Al Jazeera, the first thing the tanks will do is demolish any high buildings, so there's no snipers. And when you got rid of the high buildings, you start knocking down the lower buildings. And it's just going to be absolute carnage. The play, I mean, the, 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 they're saying that a million Palestinians can move to the south and then later come back. But all they'll be coming back to is a rubble heap. Gaza will be, the north of Gaza will be unlivable. And I think these, these are things that, you know, we've got to take up as well. I think that the, the whole thing about class unity is the only way. But I think we've got to start raising class unity in Britain, in France, in America and everywhere else. That the working class and their organisations have got to take up an immediate demand for ceasefire, for the absolute annihilation of the Gazans. The, remembering Cromwell's thing about to hell or Connacht for the Irish, Netanyahu seems to be to hell or Egypt Sinai. And they'll set up a massive well, prison camp there for the for the for the uh, Palestinians because there's no way Indian I Israel, sorry Egypt wants uh, a population of uh, Palestinians who would be entering in those conditions to be in there. <clears throat> I think the the other thing is uh, where was it? No, this thing about labour unity and the class unity. I mean, the question of a one state or two state is somewhere down the road, I would think, for anything that's going to happen. 
I think Finn's right in saying it's up to the workers in Israel, Palestine, to sort things out. But to do that, you're going to need a revolution, quite honestly. You're not going to do it through a, res a resolution at a trade union conference and it's going to happen. You're going to need massive change within the that part of the world for class unity to develop. And one of the reasons why I think we could help class unity develop, if we show class unity in Europe, in America, in Asia and all the rest of it, where the working class are struggling. So I think that's, and taking up these issues as well, saying that there is somebody on your side. The Arab states around Israel are more interested in getting to bed with Egypt, with Israel, than doing anything about their own population, never mind anything about the Palestinians. So I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Okay, John. Right, uh, John Byrne. I, w I was coming home on the bus the other day and a guy had his phone on loud and there was some American commenting on what was happening in Gaza. And he says, how is it that Israel has probably the best intelligence organization in the world, i.e. Mossad, and yet it has also the tightest border in the world, i.e. Gaza. How is it that you can get a bulldozer rolling up to the border and ripping down the fence without any reaction? And I think that is a question that has to be seriously asked of the Israeli government. How is it that you can get hundreds of Hamas fighters going over the border and creating mayhem without any reaction to them. We've got to think of Israel as a small country, something like the size of Wales or Northern Ireland. You're about half an hour's drive from Jerusalem. There are police forces in Jerusalem that should have been mobilized from an Israeli point of view immediately and sent to the border. Instead of that, Hamas were given the whole of Saturday to create havoc in kibbutzes and towns in that border area. And quite frankly, without seeing myself as a conspiracy theorist, the whole thing stinks to high heaven. Now, what you're getting in Israel, particularly where in the West Bank with the settlers, is the basically the Palestinians are being driven off the land. They've been denied their own water to water their crops. And the pal uh, Oh, <laughs> just hang on a minute, see if they come back. To get guns, etc. <laughs> the thing is that in Israel at the moment, they had a guy, uh, an ex-Mossad, uh, guy on Al Jazeera to give it a balance and he said look we're giving out hundreds of work permits to people so what you're getting is people particularly farmers are forced to give up their land because of harassment from the settlers and becoming day laborers and the fact is that in Gaza there are hundreds of work permits that were being given out so that Gazans would go into Israel to get work. A bit akin, in my opinion, to what happened at the end of the 19th century on the docks where you had the pen and where the various companies on the docks could go and pick who they wanted to come and work for them. Now, we talk about unity of the working class. I think as far as I'm concerned, one of the basic aims would be to question the whole thing of cheap labour coming from Palestine into Israel and that the trade unions in Israel should be demanding that workers that come in are paid the proper rate for the day and not undercutting. And in Gaza and the Palestinian areas, they should be demanding that there should be no such thing as this cheap labour because what's happened in the West Bank because Israel immediately cut off after Saturday, 
returns to Gaza, that there's literally hundreds of Gazans in the West Bank, and the West Bank, if you like, uh, Palestinian organizations are overwhelmed because they're not in a position to cater for them. They've come, the most of them were just, the Israeli government told their employers, sack all the guys and workers, and they were left high and dry. They couldn't go back for their phones, they couldn't go back to get their clothing, etc. So I think there is, if you like, a small area of if you like demands for class unity, that you do not want a pool of cheap labour, i.e. the Bantu stand version, as has been mentioned, that you want proper, if you like, organised trade union setups for labour. And from that, you then begin to ask the question, who the hell allowed the carnage on Saturday? Because for my money, it was the Israeli government and now... They are out to dump the Gazan population into the Sinai and leave that as Egypt's problem. And Egypt has said, no, we're not having it. So I'll leave it at that, comrades. OK, thanks, Dominic. Thanks, John. We're starting to get towards the end of time. I'm thinking, Finn, you might need about 15 minutes or so to sum up. Does that sound about right after, after we finish the discussion? Uh, I wouldn't be... need a... Wouldn't need that long, you yeah. don't need as much as that, right? Okay. Yeah. So at the moment we've got four people, four people wanting to speak. So I'm going to take Andros next, then Richard Meller, and then Roger, and depending on the time, Matthew, because you have spoken already. So if we just ask comrades to be mindful of the time now, please, because it is now twenty five minutes past five. So Andros, would you like to go first? Oh, Patrick as well. <laughs> okay. Hello, comrades. Hello, Andros. Um, you hear me okay? Yeah, fine. Uh, I think we all agree with Finn's introduction, um, at least on all the basic points, uh, and particularly on the issue of the, the class approach, that uh, the only way to solve the Palestinian problem is through the class approach and through the united struggle of the uh, Jewish and Palestinian Arab uh, working classes. Uh, but at the same time, we understand that this is much more difficult today than it was five years ago or 20 years ago or 50 years ago. Uh, and this has to do with the fact that the international left has been weakened. Um, the traditional left parties have uh, capitulated. The new left parties have capitulated. Um, and the PLO, Fatah, etc., they failed. And as a result of this, we have this massive turn in the region to Islamic fundamentalism uh, up after the Iranian revolution, which went under the control of Khomeini. Um, so the idea that class approaches, the answer is the correct one. But at the same time, I think we need to understand the, the complications and the difficulties. Uh, and the fact that when we say class approach, we cannot mean, we should not mean only uh, between Palestinians and Jewish workers. It's an international thing. It's the regional thing and it's an international thing in the sense that unless we build new forces of the left, which are characterized by the class approach, by the Marxist method, in other words, this will not work. So at the end of the day, it's it's an international struggle to build the forces of the left, which and this will uh, have its impact on the Palestinian uh, the developments around the Palestinian issues. Uh, we are not there, and therefore we have to be very careful about how we pose demands. Um, it, it's un unquestionable that the people in the Gaza Strip. Uh, they are rallying behind Hamas. I'm not sure if this is the case in the West Bank, but that's not what decides our positions anyway. We have a position against Islamic fundamentalism. We have a position against um, all the Islamic fundamentalist um, well, regimes, movements, etc. Uh, in the region, we know they don't provide the answer. So we have to find a way to 
um, differentiate ourselves from their proposals and their uh, solutions. Uh, I think the main task that we face in our countries um, is to um, make convince people about the, the reality of the Palestinian problem. Who is the real aggressor? Remind of the history because the new generations do not know the history. The Palestinian question today is not approached by the mass by, by the mass of the populations of the planet like it was 30 or 40 years ago. Uh, they, they don't know that uh, the aggressor has been Israel. Um, and therefore, that's the main thing I think we need to bring to the surface. What is really happening in Palestine? And, and it's possible that in the next couple of weeks, uh, as the aggression of Israel leads to uh, more and more um, slaughter of civilians and uh, um, you know, I mean, what they, they tend to, they tend to um, smash everything um, uh, in uh, in in the Gaza Strip. Uh, it's it's possible that this will be there will be more open ears in the days and couple of weeks that uh, will come, and therefore we need to intensify our campaign in defense of the Palestinian people. But at the same time, I I say that we must find ways to differentiate ourselves from the tactics used by Hamas and from Hamas itself, because this has had an effect uh, on, in, on, the, on the mass consciousness in the countries where we are living. Uh, the other thing that I think we need to bring to the surface strongly is the hypocrisy of Western governments. Um, Germany was mentioned by comrade uh, Irem, who said that um, shouting certain slogans, it's illegal. It's illegal to wear the Palestinian, uh, what do you call this, around the neck in Germany now. In France, uh, it's illegal to demonstrate in favor, in favor of uh, the Palestinians, uh, in favor of the, of the rights, of the demands of the Palestinian people. It's illegal to demonstrate. Actually, there is a kind of a time bomb, I think, which has been planted here. Uh, France is the is the country with the biggest uh, Muslim and Arab uh, populations in in Europe. Um, so they are kind of bringing the problem into their own countries, and at the same time, this is developing into a major geopolitical thing, because um, Russia and China have not taken the side of Israel; they are distancing themselves from it. So the what we what has been described as a new Cold War and the vicious competition which is developing between the US and the West and China and Russia uh, over who dominates the planet, over what's happening in Ukraine, it, it it's, it's it's going to have a spill of effect, I think, also in the area uh, of the middle of the Middle East. Um, Iran is involved, the Lebanon is involved, Hezbollah is involved. We don't know, we cannot predict to what extent they, they will get involved, but it's really dividing and polarizing the lines also in this part of the uh, planet. Um, and Josh, and Josh, you've had a good five minutes. Would you be able to draw your comments to a close? Just got rather a few hands up again, if possible, please. Uh, one word on the... Um, on the issue of the two, one or two state solution. I think that we all we would all like to have one unified state. How do we get there? Um, it's, it's extremely difficult to see how things will develop precisely because there is no leadership, no class leadership. I think the main thing is to ha see how we can approach the masses of Palestine and the masses of Israel and make proposals that can develop class consciousness. And in this sense, I think the idea of self-determination has to be accepted for both sides. We want the self-determination of the, the right, self-determination of the Palestinians at the same time as uh, the for the uh, Israeli masses. Um, if you take this, if you say self-determination, but no to uh, a two-state solution, that it means that one of the two will impose its will on the others. That's why I think that it's quite complicated. and. Uh, Repeating again that we are not there so as to be able to formulate things in precise way, 
Um, I think we have to be very open about um, the, this issue of one or two state solutions, which is a tactical slogan. It's not a, a principled uh, position to, um, I mean, the principled position is for a unitary state at some stage, but in, in, in the meantime, as a tactical uh, slogan, I think we have to be open to the idea of a two-state solution. Sorry for taking longer. That's okay. Thanks very much, Andros. There's still quite a few hands up. So I can, if we could just ask everybody to be as concise as they can, we may just have to go over for a few minutes, I think, because obviously people are making important points. Now, Richard Mellor, I know you, I think we'll take Richard Mellor next. I'm going to take Kiram next because I know you've tried quite a few times to get into the discussion and then the other comrades. So, Richard Mellor, are you there? Somewhere? You asked me on the chat if you could come into the discussion. Richard Miller. Is Richard here? Can't see him. So I've just can you hear me now? Ah yes, they're right. Okay, Richard. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, we can... I, I'm sorry. I firstly I'm I'm trying to I don't want to speak too quickly to be within time limits because then I forget everything. But I, I first I apologize I came in late. I missed Finn's uh, introduction and everything else. But I want to say a few things that uh, um, in response to what's been said, and also just what I think about this insane, a little bit about what I think about this this crazy situation. Um, it, it, in, in, in terms of the, I think it was Dave, in terms of the, the, the state, one state or two state solutions. I mean, if, if I'm asked, I make it clear and I believe it that there's a, there, there isn't a solution under capitalism. There's no solution to this problem under capitalism. And that's the starting point. So I, I, to me, if someone wants to debate whether there's going to be a new a one state or a two state, I, I don't think there's a possibility of a solution. And without, and then of course it leads to the question of, you know, well, what is? And then we get into our, the position, the question of the so of socialism and the, the revolutionary, the class position and the revolutionary alternative. Um, in 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 regards to Hamas, I think it's a mistake to get bogged down in a debate over Hamas, because uh, you'll, you'll, you'll we'll just get sidetracked. It's like the whole Ukraine thing. If you question Zelensky, you're a Putin apologist. Uh, uh, you're a, the, all of the things, you can't even raise it. Um, it we, we know we, we voice our opposition to Islamic fundamentalism and so forth and so forth. But I, I, I will not personally get bogged down into defending uh, uh, I, I have not um, uh, condemned this assault, uh, uh, this resistance, no matter, uh, but I'm not going to, and I've made my clear, position clear on Hamas, but I'm not going to get bugged down in a long debate over that. The, um, on the, whether the, they, the, the conspiracy and whether he let it happen, I think it's far more likely from everything I know about Israel that I watch and talk about with people and everything else, I think that, um, that there is an overconfidence there. They don't die there in the way that the Palestinians do. They can brutalize people. They can kill them. They can kill children. They, it, it, it's a horrible place. And if you've seen those ones where those settlers take over the tops of houses and they pour their garbage on the Palestinians below. I mean, uh, uh, I think there's this confidence with certain Israelis, and I've met Arab Israelis, Jewish uh, Jewish uh, Jewish Israelis from Arab uh, Morocco, and and they're definitely a bit different. Although their parents, one told me they're a brainwashed. But this Moroccan Jew and Israeli I met said he wanted to go back and find his Jewish roots in Morocco. I think it's far more likely that um, that they're they're arrogant and overconfident. I mean, they just don't get killed. And, and uh, yeah, and the, and the fence, it's not breached. It's rarely ever breached and so forth. So I think that's much more likely that they were just too overconfident um, in, in relation to. Um, so, oh, and, and the aftermath of this, I think that Netanyahu is finished. I think that um, uh, um, the consciousness of the Israeli, I'm just, what do I know? I have no people on the ground there, but my feeling is that the the um, the consciousness of the uh, uh, Jewish Israelis is going to be completely transformed by this event, and and 
I, I don't know exactly how it's going to be played out, but there's no way this cannot change the the, the Jew, Jewish Israelis. Uh, uh, and it's not all negative. They cannot, in my mind, be all negative. And um, it, it, I was talking with Jack yesterday because we were both a bit depressed about it. And of course, it's inevitable there's going to be anti-Semitic issues as well. But... Um, I, I felt well, I, we were talking a little bit depressed, and then I then I looked at the news. There were massive demonstrations in LA and in New York. New York has the largest Jewish population outside of Israel, from what I understand, and there was a massive demonstration there. And so, my hope, I guess, or my feeling as a as a, as a socialist is, it must have been in the First World War, for instance, in the trenches. People must have thought people like my 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 relatives sitting out there in France must have thought, my God, this is the end of the world. Being in the Warsaw Ghetto or Auschwitz must have been the uh, this is the end of the world. And unfortunately, given the the what it was it Trotsky said about the leadership of the working class is the crisis of the working class. Given that tragic, great things, a vicious brutality is likely in some places and everything else. And hopefully, and I think more likely, live, leaving aside nuclear war, and people sending some nuclear bombs around, is there will be positive reactions and there will be a positive development and there will be uh, some movements of the working class even, just spontaneously even, to, to class unity in some way. Um, uh, just to close with this, I think the other thing is, uh, to, just to let you know, I mean, with, uh, what I feel is, um, I saw Biden and he just got slammed because of the beheading babies issue. I mean, he's this stupid, stupid man. Uh, uh, this country is in such a crisis. You know, they can't provide they can't run a candidate that's over under 80 or whatever and and, and stupid, you know. And um, I think it will increase. Well, I, yeah, I'm almost positive it's doing it. Increase support for the Chinese, the Russians, the non-aligned, the African states and former colonial states. Uh, Brazil uh, and these and the BRICS or uh, uh, whatever you call it, the uh, trying to find uh, talking about a multipolar world and and uh, against Western colonial and uh, imperialist uh, power. And I think that um, that's going to increase. And um, and I think that that's really all I had to say. I'm sorry I didn't get on, um, and I still can't figure out why I can't get. I'm sure people miss not having my face on there because you know I, I'm so pretty. <laughs> A little bit of humor here and there, right? Uh, but anyway, yes, I'm sorry I got on late and missed Finn's um, introduction. Right. Thanks, anyway. Thanks. You got in eventually. That's the important thing. Thanks very much, Richard. Yeah, right. It, okay. Uh, Ira Mariah, I'm sorry, I'm not sure how to pronounce you now. Would you like to go next? Hi. Hi. Um, my name is pronounced as Irem. Irem. Um, Irem. Yes. Hi, uh, everyone. Hello. I am a, a socialist young woman from Turkey, and um, I spent quite a lot of time in Palestine. My research was um, about a theater in the West Bank, in a theater uh, located in the north of the West Bank. And I mean, obviously, I have a lot to say because I witnessed a lot of things, but I feel like as, as a person from Turkey and as a descendant of one of the identities which colonized Palestine before British, I think we have lots of things to consider. And one of the things that we need to consider is the issue of self-determination. Because right now we are facing... A, a cognitive dissonance, in my opinion, about the issue of self-determination, because when we when we even mention it, we are forced to condemn Hamas. If 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 we don't say something about Hamas, it it immediately means that we're anti-Semite, and this is not okay, because the whole situation which led things here basically is like the root cause is something happened in Europe, right? I mean, we are talking about something related to Western colonialism at its core. And in my opinion, not only my opinion, but even Israeli historian Ilan Pape 
refuses to basically describe the situation as even occupation. I mean, he prefers to describe the situation as Western colonization, settler colonialism, because it is settler colonialism. And we need to be aware, like how to how to describe it. And in our own countries, we need to be mindful about how um, it's manifested. So as a, as a citizen from Turkey, which basically, I mean, benefits a lot of um, privileges from abuse of centuries of centuries of occupation of Palestine. I'm talking about Ottoman Empire um, era. We all, like as, as Turkish citizens, even like I'm not even mentioning Israeli occupation or British occupation, as Turkish citizens, we need to be aware of the supremacy in our own country. So that's why when I hear all of you speaking about the issue about Israel-Palestine, I really think that our focus should be about the, um, the dynamics in our own countries, how the issue of occupation of Palestine is manifested in our own local politics and how it is being played by um, the populists, the fascists, the Islamophobes, the anti-Semites in our own countries, including Ireland, including the United Kingdom, including France, including the United States, where have you? In Turkey, we have the issue of Kurds, right? Because we, like Kurds are the majority of the um, minorities. And we have like a, a very major issue um, of polarization right now because our government is an Islamist government, which forcefully um, denies all the atrocities committed by Hamas and all, all basically jihadist organizations and, and I mean, actively helping jihadist organizations in Syria, in Azerbaijan, in Artsakh against uh, Armenians. I mean, like our government is involved in active ethnic cleansing not only in Palestine, but in Armenia and Syria against Kurdish civilians and in Turkey too. So as socialists in Turkey, that's why I'm giving this example as, as, as a person from Turkey, because I think we really need to um, consider the realities in our own countries. I, I really think that we need to be mindful about our own governments at, motivations of atrocities and supremacy against um, civilians, against um, religious or ethnic minorities, etc. So I really think that as socialists, our focus needs, needs to be about fighting against um, fascism uh, in our own countries, how it's manifested within uh, the concept of Western colonialism, because it has many shapes and forms. In Turkey, it has many shapes and forms. Because in Turkey, a lot of people are vocal about Palestine, but they don't give a damn about Kurdish civilians, right? And this is hypocrisy. So, and this hypocrisy exists in the United States, in United Kingdom, in European Union, and, and in the Western hemisphere at, like, at core, basically. So that's why I wanted to um, talk about this hypocrisy, because when we talk about Ukraine, like the war in Ukraine, for example. Oh, can you start finishing off, Conrad? We're just getting a bit short, so it's time now. We can start drinking your remarks for a close, if you don't mind. Sorry. Oh, OK. <laughs> Should I close up or just stop? Well, just briefly finish. I don't want to just don't start on anything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so we really need to take uh, care about our um, prejudices against certain identities, um, Islamophobia and Orientalism in our own countries and how it's manifested and how we choose to react towards certain atrocities based on the identity of the victim because it's double okay. standard. Um, that, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. That's lovely. Thanks very much, Irem. That's great. Right, I'm just going to take Patrick, followed by Roger. Matt, Matthew, you've just spoken once. We haven't really got time to start off again. All I can suggest is you make your comments in the chat and then we won't won't lose them. So just watch the time. Uh, so 
Patrick for five minutes, no more, then Roger, and then I'm going to ask Finn to sum up. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, Patrick from the Work Workers' Party Group in Sweden. I have. Uh, we always defended the right for for the Palestinians to resist the occupation, meaning that they have the right to make military attacks against the Israeli uh, army bases and stuff like this. Even if most of the time these kind of events haven't proven to be very fruitful, not very successful either. They often made things worse for the Palestinian people. But still we defended the rights for the Palestinians to defend themselves and even by military means. But I mean this, the act of Hamas now, it was not a military action. It was an act of terror. I mean, no, it was directed against civilians. And it was not directed against civilians by chance. It was really on, on purpose killing innocent people uh, in Israel. So, and I think we have, we have the moral right to, to uh, oppose these things. I even think that since we are standing on, on the shoulders of, of uh, Marxism, we even have the, we are obliged to take, to kind of condemn these kind of things. And I think it's important now, and it will be important in the future, because what is happening now, which might be a second Nakba, will increase the, um, the risk of even more acts of terror towards uh, Jewish people all around the world. So what we say now, it's not only bogging down into something that's not important. I think it's very important. So that's, that's my, my first point. Then the other thing, people have been saying we need a class position and we need to be able to talk both to Palestinian people, to Palestinian workers and to Jewish people, Jewish workers. And I think that we will never be able to uh, talk to Jewish workers if we don't, if we say that we want to de destroy the Israeli state. I think the, the Jewish workers need some kind of, um, uh, they need to have, have, have their own state. And I think that uh, in a long, long, I mean, a long perspective, a perspective of course, we, we support a world without state. We, need, we support the united uh, working class all over the world. But, but for now and for the coming foreseen foreseeable future, we need to support a Jewish state, an Israeli state, of course, with uh, defending the rights for min minorities in that state, just as in any other state. So that, that's the second point. And then I think, um, it's important to look at the kind of a broader picture. Um, what happened happens with the Palestinians uh, is very much connected to the governments and the regime in the other, other Arab, Arab countries around. Uh, because they have not only been doing, it's not that they haven't been doing anything. They have been making the situation even worse. I mean, the thing that the Palestinian Arabs are living in refugee camps still today, 70 years after the, the Nakba. I mean, it's just horrible. And it's, it has been a, a very conscious way for the, for the leaders of the Arab state to use the Palestinian Arabs as a weapon against the, the Israeli state. And I mean, Remember the Black September in the 60s where there was a war between the PLO and the, and the uh, Jordanian state. I mean, the leaders of the Arab world are not the friends of the Palestinian people. And during the Arab Spring, um, that was the first time, the whole kind of system of diplomatic connection that had, had been built up by, by the US and by the West, it was falling apart. And that, during a couple of months, Obama even suggested that a, a two-state uh, solution on the, on the uh, 
borders that was before the 1967 war. So it shows that the potential of, of uh, some kind of a solution, but the solution goes uh, through a revolution in the, in the Arabic world, in Egypt, in Jordan, and so on. That's the way forward uh, to destroy the, the, the today's power, the establishment, the, the, the regimes in these countries. That's the way forward for the Palestinian people, I think. But, but we also, of course, need to, to build bridges between Palestinian workers with workers, but we can't isolate the issue to only to th these two groups. There is a, we, we need to build we need to build bridges between Palestinian workers organizations and workers organizations in Egypt and Jordan and so on. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patrick. Right, we're on to Roger. Uh, comrades, all right, if we just run over, not more than 10 minutes, just to allow Finn to sum up at the end. Is that OK? I think it's been important to, to let everybody develop their arguments a bit longer today. Roger. Well, uh, thanks. I, I think it's been a great discussion. And um, I've got a number of points that I wanted to make, but I'm going to try and just make them very quickly. And uh, if they come out a bit garbled, uh, you'll understand why, for pre pressure of time. But I just wanted to say, well, f first of all, just to put it in the context of what's happening in the world today, that, I mean, um, just as we saw the, the, the two world wars that we've experienced were all preceded by uh, quite major outbreaks um, in the, uh, the run-up to them. Before the First World War, the Balkan Wars, before the Second World War, the uh, uh, Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia, the Spanish Civil War, and so on. And we're seeing now such a, a, a sort of heating up of the, the pressure uh, internationally. You know, we have now, out of the blue almost, two, well, one major war in Europe, the Ukraine, and what could become uh, an absolute bloodbath in uh, in the Middle East. And that, that all shows the uh, the tightening tensions in uh, in in the world today. Now, the as uh, Richard um, in the chat reminded us that the origin for for, for Israel uh, was promoted originally, anyway, by um, by British imperialism. One um, one British uh, colonial bureaucrat said, "Yes, what a good idea to create a loyal little Ulster uh, in the Middle East." As um, as a uh, sort of um, base within the uh, oil fields of uh, the Middle East, but even despite that, even even the Tsarist pogroms, uh, for instance, which I mean, which which was absolutely um, horrific uh, uh, outbreaks of, uh, of racism, but even they didn't give a basis for Zionism. Zionism was just a, a peculiar. Uh, sect until we came to to the Holocaust. The the pogroms in Eastern Europe created a massive wave of uh, migration, uh, and um, you know many of us here, including uh, my own family, are a product of that uh, process of migration. But it was not until the uh, the Holocaust that it became a basis for for um, emigration to to uh, Palestine, and. Um, it was, as I say, a product of the Holocaust, and therefore you could say only at one remove, another of the after effects of the failure of the German Revolution of nineteen eighteen to, to twenty three. Because without without Hitler, without the Holocaust, then uh, the the this whole issue would um, would probably not have um, arisen. So, but we also have to say that Zionism sometimes it's presented as if it was something uniquely evil or only comparable to Nazism and so on. And there are actually parallels in in history. It's not you. It's nothing unique. Uh, the um, and I have to say, by the way, just in passing, let's remember always that the uh, those people who in the labour movement in Britain who claim to be uh, opposed to anti-Semitism and to, who accuse the left of anti-Semitism. On the contrary, it was the um, 
British right-wing Labour Home Secretary during the uh, Second World War, who blocked entry to nine-tenths of those Jews who were seeking refuge and sanctuary and escape from uh, the Holocaust. It was um, it was the British Foreign Secretary in the post-war Labour government, Bevin, who sank the ships carrying migrants of uh, display of uh, you know, people who were completely homeless, who were completely dispossessed, who were seeking refuge from the displaced persons camps, who were the few survivors of the Holocaust from the concentration camps, and he sank their ships in the Mediterranean um, uh, at the time. So that's that we have to remember that the, the and they were not those migrants were not seeking to create a Jewish state or a Zionist state. They simply needed somewhere to live. They couldn't go back to the. Uh, anyway, we can't go through the history uh, history of that. The comrades will uh, get the point. But it was. Um, we have to say, therefore, that Zionism and the uh, migration of Jews to to um, to Palestine is not a unique, uh, not a unique um, phenomenon. There's a parallel even with the original settlers in the USA who were fleeing. The original settlers were fleeing persecution as uh, persecuted religious sects from Europe. And uh, later, uh, waves of uh, migration of people escaping unemployment, who then, when they arrived in, uh, in, the, uh, in America, then that began the, uh, the horrific wars of the, against the indigenous population of, uh, of the USA and so on. Do we say that the Jews should be driven out of... Um, out of um, Palestine, any more than uh, than we would say, for instance, the the refugees from communal horrors in the Indian subcontinent who settled in uh, in Pakistan. We don't call. I mean, these these are, these are part of the process of history. We we don't say drive them out. We say we have to find a socialist solution of uni unity of the population. Now, Israel now is preparing what could what looks like it's going to be a second Nakba, and almost um, almost you could describe it in terms of genocide. Absolute, absolutely horrific situation. But we also, we have to say that Hamas, by, by, um, by their latest action, uh, you, you know, has actually succeeded, apart from the savagery of what they did, apart from the, from the crime of targeting civilians, um, but we also have to say, politically, it was not just a crime, it was a mistake in that they unified the Jewish population of Israel uh, just at a time when there were the first, ser first serious stirrings of a polarization within the Jewish population of, of um, Israel. So what's the answer? I would say, yes, certainly we say one state, since then, you know, that we can't, there's no basis now for saying separate Palestinian Arab state and a separate Jewish state. But I don't think that's enough to say just one state, because all the states of the Middle East were simply lines drawn in a map by British and French imperialism at the end of the First World War, the Sykes-Picot uh, deal and so on. And we see not only, of course, on a different scale, but nevertheless, we see all kinds of ethnic and um, communal and sectarian conflicts Within all the uh, within all the states of the Middle East, we see in 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 Iran, of course, and also in I I Iraq, and in Lebanon, and uh, all the rest, which has created civil wars and um, horrors, uh, indescribable, unending uh, horrors over whole period. Now, what we have to say is that what we don't just want um, a um, a single state in in Israel Palestine. We should be calling for a socialist federation of the Middle East in which all of these minorities, Jews included, would find their place uh, in, a, in, a, in a unified uh, uh, situation. Uh, there's a lot more that I wish to say, but it's um, time is getting on. But I think it's been a really very stimulating and useful um, discussion. OK, thanks very much, Roger. So uh, back to you, Finn. If we try and get finished for about 10 past, if you could manage to draw your conclusions in that time. I don't know if such a, a thing is possible. Yeah, could I say uh, at the outset, comrades, that some really important issues have been raised here and there has been very important insights shown and very uh, insightful uh, discussion. Uh, we don't resolve 
questions and discussions of this nature. We discuss issues and try to find out what's the best programmatic and the best socialist approach to take on various issues. So we're going to come back to all of these questions again. They won't be resolved. But there's one or two general points I want to make. First of all, with regard to Netanyahu. Netanyahu has made absolutely clear what he wants to achieve. He wants all of the Palestinians out of uh, the land, which was once British Mandate Palestine, which is the West Bank, Gaza, and uh, Israel. His clear strategy is to get all Palestinians out. And towards that objective, he has diminished the rights even of Arab citizens in Israel, sorry, Israeli Arab citizens who live in Israel. 20% of the Israeli population is Arabic. Their rights are diminished, for example, in East Jerusalem. Their rights in terms of uh, access to um, finance, bringing their families. Um, there's a lot of rules that apply specifically to Palestinians who live in Israel to diminish their status as citizens. And his policy in the West Bank is to drive them all out. So we have to oppose that. We have to fight against that and raise that, as Iram mentioned, in our own countries. Uh, the question of settlements has to be faced. There should be no settlement policy in the West Bank. That land is taken from the uh, native Palestinian uh, population, and that should not be allowed. And we need to take a stance on that. So these are questions where there would be agreement. Uh, there was a lot of uh, questions then raised about the issue of the one state and two state. We're all in favour of a single, unified, socialist state. And as Roger has alluded also, to a federation of socialist states across the Middle East, including not just uh, Palestine and Israel, but all of the states going from uh, Egypt across. And as I mentioned, also even in West Asia, some of the states there should be part of that process um, in, in addition. The, the, there'd be no settlement of any issue until the socialist issues are raised. And we should mention with regard to uh, socialism, even though it might seem a bit abstract now, Wherever there's class society or society based on capitalism, there's going to be division. There's going to be fights and class struggle taking place. It doesn't matter whether the country is Israel or Palestine or Jordan or wherever. Where you have people working in industry, there's owners and there's workers. In transport and services and education, hospitality, trade, all of these areas. And we have to accept that as a reality. So there will be class struggle in all of these countries. And we're trying to provide a program and an approach that will unite Palestinian and Jewish workers in the immediate uh, instance uh, in, in that regard. Unity. I should mention with regard to Israel, there's discrimination in Israel against the Jews as well. The Mizrahi Jews, which came from um, countries other than the, uh, from Europe, uh, there's one group of Jews came from Ashkenazi group from Eastern Europe principally, and then there was Jews that came in from North Africa. Mizrahi Jews, as they are called, and the Mizrahi are discriminated against in terms of employment rights, jobs, accommodation, and so on. There's an interesting point raised by Iram about the Kurds. The Kurds were excluded in the sykes pico Pact. They were not awarded a country of their own, the way the other uh, sections of Middle Eastern society were, and they were scattered across four countries. So the rights of Kurds have also to be recognised in the terms of establishing uh, a democratic regime. But there is one state or two state. We can argue about that. We're not going to resolve that. And But we're in favour of a single unified socialist state that recognises the rights of all the peoples, minorities, ethnic, national and so on, within the boundaries of the state. In the short term, it doesn't seem possible to achieve the two-state solution. There's no question. Even though it was agreed in Oslo in 1990, we're further away from that now than ever principally because the land which belonged to Palestinians has been annexed and brought into the state of Israel. And what you have now is a massive scatter of settlements right across the West Bank, which is seen by the Israeli government as part of Israel. And you have a minority, uh, of a, a, a less prosperous uh, group of areas where Palestinians live. But that's part of Netanyahu's policy, to drive out the Palestinians. And the example that I gave of uh, Hebron is just uh, an illustration of the contempt that the settlers have. You see the settlers walking around Hebron carrying AK-47s on their shoulders, the same way as somebody might be walking in the street in Dublin or London with a shopping bag. They tote the guns. They attack Palestinians in their homes. 
burned down. Not all settlers, and by the way, I'm not generalizing, but people have been attacked in their homes. Their homes have been burnt down. The villages burnt down by groups of settlers. We also need to put a lot more stress on the right-wing nature of the uh, Netanyahu uh, regime. Uh, I don't think it helps to describe them as fascist because um, they're not. Uh, it's not a fascist uh, government or anything close to a fascist government. There are comparisons, definitely, in relation to apartheid. That's a close comparison. Or the example that Roger gave, actually, about uh, the people who want the original settlers in America turning their anger against the native populations that already lived there. That's a better comparison. But in terms of apartheid, the fact that different laws apply and different uh, social rules apply to Palestinians and to Jews makes the comparison with uh, apartheid um, quite a useful one. If it's Matthew raised the issue of the history, there's no question, well, I mentioned it in my opening contribution, but the question that Matthew raised is correct. The history was set up as an anti-Arab group, and Arabs were not uh, facilitated in getting work. And when they did, in many cases, they couldn't join the history. So the history set up their own Palestinian uh, union that they could keep an eye on Arab workers, keeping them all the time at arm's length from good jobs and good uh, prospects of employment. And then the Arab unions were set up separately. There was a time when there was unity between Arab and uh, uh, Jewish workers also, like in Haifa amongst the docks. There was a tradition of workers fighting together. Nonetheless, the Hisodot split that unity. But the question I'm raising is not whether the Hisodot is right or left. We're, we're in agreement, uh, all of us, I would say, about the negative role the Hisodot has played. And for that matter, also the Israeli Labour Party, which has been in power many times not in recent years, but has been in power and has not resolved the questions of, of the, the state in the same way. But nonetheless, but a hasty dot. There has to be a unified trade union movement in Israel. Now, whether it emerges from the history dot or against the history dot or wherever, that's not the, the question. That's a question that might evolve. But we need to recognize that there needs to be an independent and separate trade union structure in Israel because there's a capitalist system in Israel. One of the comrades raised this question about the slogans. We had a demonstration in Dublin yesterday also, and there's all this chanting about Palestine will be free from the river to the sea, presumably the River Jordan to the Mediterranean. But that has no meaning. What does that mean? Now, in 1948, that would have been a good slogan, actually, when the British mandate had uh, control not only over what's today Israel and the West Bank, they also included in the mandate what's now Jordan. So it would have been a demand that you would raise then, and it would have a meaning. In fact, it would go beyond the river, it would go to the west, the east bank of the Jordan as well. But to, to show today about Palestine will be free in the context of a massacre that's taking place, I mean, that's just not the right issue. The issue that's been posed now is how do you stop, if it can be done, how do you stop the pending massacre of people in Gaza? And one of the things we need to look at also is the Israeli army. The Israeli army is made of conscripts. And when we were in Palestine, we spoke to some army people, not just break the silence. On one occasion, we stopped at a checkpoint and spoke to the soldier at the checkpoint. And he was talking freely about the kind of stuff they have to do. It's a compulsory service everybody does in Israel, men and women. So we should demand that um, within the army that people don't fight in the same ways in 1914, the demand went out. Workers shouldn't fight. Why should Israeli uh, workers, young workers in this case, because they're all young people in the army, uh, sacrifice their lives or risk their lives in a war in Gaza, which is unjustifiable? So we have to raise all of these questions because of the class nature of uh, Israeli society. And it's correct to say that Israel was established as an output of imperialism in the Middle East. That's correct. And uh, American imperialism in particular relies on Israel to defend its interests. But that wasn't always the case. There was a time when the British supported the Arab states because their main allies were amongst the Arab states. It's a cynical approach by governments all the time to use whatever divisions or whatever uh, allies they can find in the countries that they want to dominate. But they supported the Arab states, and that's partly why they were opposed to Jewish immigration in Palestine uh, after the war, in order to keep the Arab states on side. They put their own king into power in Jordan, King Hussein, they put their own king into power in Iraq. This is the way they operate all the time. The French established a religious regime in Lebanon. 
to suit their interests for the uh, uh, Christian groups had a majority of the population. All the imperial powers use uh, divisions in various countries to suit themselves. When we talk about socialism, we're talking about a broad swathe of human rights, labor rights, and so on. Just the democratic demands, the democratic issues that we take for granted have not been established in terms of the, uh, the populations of, of uh, Palestine and Israel. Whatever unions exist, small do they be, do they be fragmented? Do they be, uh, and history does, regardless of its racist and the divisive background. There has to be an independent trade union movement in Israel, and anybody whom we could influence in Israel, we would influence in that direction, and likewise in the Palestinian uh, areas, advocate for the unity between the workers and the uh, workers, uh, Palestinian and Jewish. Palestinian workers work in Jerusalem. We saw them all attending there. There's a big population of, uh, particularly from Bethlehem and the neighboring places, who go to Jerusalem to work. So there's contact between workers. So there has to be a basis for trade unions. So just to conclude on that very general point, whether something is difficult to accomplish, whether something seems very distant and very, very far in terms of perspectives, if it's the correct approach, it has to be advocated for. We have to advocate for unity of the working class, regardless of how difficult that might be, because things can change very quickly as well. I mean, there is poverty and class uh, division in Israeli society. How can that division be turned into a political movement that can take on the Israeli regime? It has to be done and we have to argue for it. Socialism might seem a bit abstract. It's even more abstract to call for the uh, unity in a socialist perspective of Egypt, Jordan, Israel. But we still have to advocate uh, for that. That's what we stand for, and that's going to be the resolution of the problem. So a socialist federation of the Middle East is a correct demand. A class approach is the correct approach. So once again, comrades, all that's happened in this discussion is it's been a very fruitful discussion. Issues have been raised. Some issues dealt with in some depth. Other issues just touched on. But regardless, it's been a very important, very useful and very insightful discussion. And the comrades have put a lot of thought and consideration into the points that they make. So thanks again. And I think that the things we could, the stuff we leave this meeting with, the ideas that have been raised and the stuff that's been brought up and argued for, we'll take away and we'll examine it and we'll sharpen and, you know, sharpen our perspectives and our approach to these questions. That's great. Thanks very much, Finn, for an excellent lead off and uh, a summing up. Thanks to everybody else for their contributions. I think we've had a, a very rich and a very important discussion today. So it was worth, I think, taking a bit more time over it. Can we jump back to you, Roger, about next week now? You have to unmute yourself, though. We won't know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just wanted to say one thing about today's meeting, that it was very good to see. We had comrades here from 10 countries uh, on four continents. So I think that's that's um, probably the best representation we've had for some time, and apart from the quality of the discussion. Uh, right, next week um, we're talking about the lessons of the Chilean coup. The coup in Chile, well, well we just, just uh, passed the 10th anniversary of the coup in Chile. And uh, it has, of course, rich lessons for socialists everywhere. So uh, I hope to see everybody next week. OK, thanks very much, Roger. Well, that's the end of the meeting. Thank everybody for their attendance. And I hope we'll see you same time next Sunday. Bye for now. <laughs>